Welcome everyone for cloud computing and big data. Um, today we have our lecture five, MapReduce Computing Paradigm, the second part. So the first part really established a little bit the connection between map reduce and divide and conquer, basically a simple principle from computer science, if you want, that stand the test of time. That's why we call it a little bit a computing paradigm because uh, this will have still relevance in many years because it's an idea how you process data, maybe also a little bit in an independent way as we learned in the last lecture. And the independence comes from the idea that the workers that then doing the, let's say, divide step, um, that this is something where there comes scalability in and they don't need to have really lots of close interactions with each other. And we will talk about this again also today. But one more element then is also the idea that MapReduce was not really just MapReduce. In order to understand MapReduce and the, the bigger framework that is really behind it, um, there are two elements. And one element was a processing engine, really the computing idea that MapReduce is in, in the realm, really a map sort shuffle um, grouping and then reducing. And this will come back to us. But the second part really of the MapReduce a larger ecosystem, if you want, also from the computing perspective, is the data and also the file system, the Hadoop distributed file system, for example, that we will talk on now in the second part a bit more than just looking on the computing engine. With this, we enable something we call data locality. Uh, we enable fault tolerance, resilience of applications. And this brings, of course, then the idea of bringing a larger MapReduce ecosystem on top of this MapReduce engine. So. Let's talk a little bit more now about the second part um, that we have. And where the first part was really talking much more about the computing part of it. Here we have the idea, if you look back also to the idea of Spark, it had also some ideas of a so-called reliable file system, right? So this is basically, um, you know, enabled by um, several different factors that enables, again, fault tolerance that assume error, errors all the time. And we have to deal with this. Hence, we need a specialized file system that assumes these errors as default, if you want to name it like this. And the design of this was basically then this Hadoop distributed file system in the implementation that you then have in the Apache Hadoop framework and works nicely then also together with MapReduce. And this part here now will also make the connection. And you see that this distributed file system is now actually broader used even together with Spark or many other open source tools. And this is a quite important technology, hence we will look into it. Also, again, when we think about the realism of a big data center, we were talking about this also in lecture four, if you remember that we have the Google data center, for instance, but it doesn't matter, could be Amazon, could be also Microsoft, all these large data centers that in one respect enables this economics of scale, which is good with very condensed hardware, right? In this racks that you see here. Um, but of course, this also means lots of CPU failures, overheating, uh, switches have errors, network failures, um, some nodes might be unreachable. Hence th this idea of now really taking this into account when designing a file, designing this MapReduce engine was really one of the key ingredient and sets it a little bit also apart from parallel file systems like Luster that you would have in the high performance computing world that are a little bit more thinking about concurrent access to files than rather being very much fault tolerant, enable data locality and, and all of these aspects that you would have here in a much more distributed fashion. Hence, we have to talk about a little bit about relevant statistics in that idea in this context. And, and this is something where there are different terms. Um, one of this is this availability. Of course, when you put, you know, SLAs, service level agreements, basically with your customers in place as a data center, you have to give these statistics. And of course, many of them give you quite high statistics these days, especially in Amazon Web Services, you see 99.9% .9 or so because they're very much regional services, um, but also operate globally. That means you have lots of lots of um, possible, let's say, other computer nodes that you can use um, that are not, you know, in the same geographical um, area. Hence, there comes lots of resilience again and fault tolerance, but this is more on the hardware level. We also have to think about the software level, and this is where this comes here basically into account um, the whole stack. 
so that everything is operational. And there are several different factors like the MTBF, like the mean time between failures, which is then basically the addition of the mean time to failure. And then, of course, you would have also something to repair that, which means the mean time to repair, obviously. And all of that time, um, you basically have then to think about um, that what we are interested in, in this respect, when we, let's say, have this failure, and also then, of course, the idea that we have the, um, you know, the repair. And um, when we have this formula here, we are interested in the availability over time. So, Hence, this adds up, of course, and, and something where, um, you know, this, of course, is something what data centers want to prevent. But the realism is that some of the elements will be always it's, uh, having failures, faults, errors. It's just life like that in the big data center. And it, some of the reasonings are here. So hardware faults we already discussed um, could be very different devices that fail, CPUs, overheating, and so forth, but also sometimes faults in the software. Right. And, and somewhere even maybe in the hardware design or switch configurations, uh, different elements um, and operation faults is then really thinking about more the idea of bringing the whole operation of the data center together. There could be mistakes even by humans, right, that work in these operations. Um, and then, of course, we have the, let's say, extreme case where we have environmental problems like earthquakes, uh, flood fire or maybe even volcano, maybe that is close to a data center. Uh, luckily, here in Iceland, I think there's not directly a data center um, at the volcano. There is, however, the burn data center, uh, which is closer to Keflavik. So it's not that far away, um, but still luckily not affected by the current eruptions. However, um, another, let's say, element that usually we would spend a bit more time on in this course, but it's also part of more other, let's say, fundamental computer science course at the universities are the rate levels. So you have this redundant area of independent disks, which gives you different levels of really think about, you know, replication schemes, um, think about, you know, how you put different pieces of the data redundant on different areas, uh, maybe again, different disks, spread that to dis different disks. And, and this is one approach of protecting your data, right? If you have this rate levels, one of it is, for instance, a complete mirror of your data, then you're basically safe putting it somewhere else. Others use some other schemes. Uh, we cannot go into details here because we have other elements uh, in the course. Of course, we want to talk a bit more about the specialized file system, which is, so to speak, another approach to this idea of always assuming error. Hence, the Hadoop distributed file system was designed uh, quite some old time ago. We already think about this you know, paper here is like over 20 years now, but still is still relevant today. Um, of course, it has been a bit evolved over time, but the key principles are still the same. You also see the connection to what we had in the first part. We have the map phase with, you know, divide here and then conquer at the end is a reduce phase. But what we didn't look at was so far um, how the master is now assigning these steps and how, of course, then also the data locality is now a principle we have to look into account or we take into account, right? So we split the data um, to different workers. They then basically assign in the map phase a little, let's say, work steps on the data. Um, and the workers are placed basically from the master then close to the data sets. They do a local write of some intermediate files, could be, for instance, the word counts in many different files uh, as a very simple key value store structure, as you have re popularly remembered from the last part. And then the, there's another, let's say, part of it, which is now the conquer step where the master is now, re, you know, just reducing based on these remote reads that you would have from these intermediate files. And when this peop, this kind of workers are then ready, this reduce phase, you put it to an output file uh, where you have then the word count, for instance, for each of the different words, right? And this is um, um, enables us also to think about then uh, elements of this fault tolerance in a moment. But this is basically the whole picture, if you want, taking into account the processing engine with a master worker paradigm that we had also in Spark, if you remember. So hence, Spark can use the same sort of idea, but just exploiting memory a bit more in Spark, as we learned. And of course, a user program can be something which is now here, our little word count as an example, maybe, but could be any other system that is, you know, crunching data into smaller pieces. In this sense, creating a high throughput access to the application data. 
and and the idea then that that came with this kind of um, um, approach is that you really relax a little bit the idea of POSIX uh, because POSIX enforces several requirements in the file system, which makes it um, you know very safe on the one hand for data, but on the other hand also a bit slower, right? And HDFS relaxes a few of these requirements to enable really this high throughput access. Also provides then um, basically a sort of replication scheme so that the same data is not just once in the whole MapReduce apparatus, if you want, in the file system, but you have different, let's say, data replication concepts. Hence, um, when we look at this a bit closer, um, this is, of course, something now where the scheduling comes in again, um, where the scheduling now is not just thinking who is actually a free worker, that is, has, you know, time. But here the idea is really putting the map task as close as possible to the worker, um, you know, that has also access to the local data. And if you then have the local data replicated, more workers will be, of course, possible. And also, if you think about that one data center will fail, you have still the data somewhere else and some workers somewhere else. That's where the resilience comes from, right? So hence, Instead of transporting now your data sets again and again to high performance computing machines and then, you know, activate this big apparatus, you know, the HPC, um, you know, parallel programs. The idea was here. Let's let's trade that in a sense against the overhead of basically uh, transporting and just have smaller compute, um, smaller algorithms, maybe if you want in this respect. But they use data locality. So you save the whole idea of always transporting. You maybe have more map tasks again and again, um, which then use maybe also the intermediate result again and again. So hence, you could think about machine learning in one respect needs to access the data again and again, as we discussed. So you maybe have some iterations here, right? It's not just word count, uh, basically reducing the words by keys to have then the overall word count. In logistic regression, what we have seen, for instance, we have seen this an optimization included. So it would have sort of an iteration on this. And this could be also quite time consuming, right? To always have master uh, assigning map tasks and reduce task. But if you think about that, otherwise you have to maybe transport terabytes of data first to the high performance computer and then back the results at some point in time, this is also quite some time. Hence there's a sort of trade-off if you want. And if you see that, you know, terabytes of data transport to to, to data centers costs a lot of time. Within academics, we have different networks that enable us to be basically be very fast. But uh, as soon as you're outside of these networks, I talk about networks like Geon, for instance, in that when you're not anymore in these networks, then it can be very slow to access basically the data. And this um, basically then prevents us really from shipping again terabytes and terabytes. And of course, think about that. That accumulates the data on a daily basis, right? People from space, um, from Facebook users, new f pictures, whatever that makes the data more and more accumulating data in these silos on a daily basis. So hence, shipping it once will not make the idea here. So we have to ship it on a daily basis again to the high performance computing to do some processing. Uh, this accumulation of data, which came along much more with this sort of social networks in the last 10 to 20 years. Um, this was also one rising factor than why MapReduce and why Facebook, for instance, also was looking into this, right? And Google uh, accumulating, you know, data from Google, the search engine and everything. So this is something also thinking about that the data transfer is here, of course, as best as possible, you know, um, not really done. Of course, you can think about when you think now the replication concept at the beginning, this distributed file system still has to transport data in the replication scheme, right? But this is done behind the, let's say, uh, really curtain in a way. So the users will specify how many times I want a certain data block, as we would call it here, replicated. You see this in a distributed file system. And then you have the different data nodes, which now are relevant for the data locality. Right. So while the map tasks need these data nodes to, you know, work on, we can now think of saying here's a replication stream of three times. Right. And this enables us now that when one disk fails, let's say, um, we can still go to another replica somewhere, you know, in this larger MapReduce cluster. 
And, and this is, of course, a configuration, right? The more replicas you have, the more throughput of applications you might get, the more fault tolerance you have. Of course, you know, the more cost you have as well, because you have the same data stored many times. Hence, you use storage, let's say here, three times. But then, of course, the trade-off comes with the idea of availability. So it's it's pretty unlikely that all of these will fail at the same time, right? Especially if you think about that these may be distributed, so really in different geographical um, regions, right? One might be in U.S., one in Asia, and one in Europe, right? Then you're sort of almost safe that so quickly nothing can happen. And this is something where where the Hadoop distributed file system is sort of very strong, um, but of course comes with a little bit of overhead, right? So firstly, this is all Java. So basically, if you want to put something in the HDFS, you basically uh, come from a normal file system and has to first, you know, have a sort of Java activated, uh, you know, application to load something within the HDFS architecture. But once it's inside, of course, then the replication schemes can begin. And still, of course, you need something like we would have in the Unix, maybe with the inode, so someone who knows where all the data is. Hence, we will find also that the Hadoop ecosystem gives you a name node. And of course, it makes sense to have a secondary name node, um, which, you know, you can see now as another master of head if you want, right? And here you see a little bit the sharding of a file. That means we don't talk about replicating file by file, but only parts of files in this particular area. And this is also basically enabling us to think much more in parallel. Um, also think again that the map task will then not go through the whole file, but only through a couple of blocks of files on different, let's say, data nodes, then also contributing again to resilience and so on. Hence, this is now optimized to be, you know, towards terabytes, and we have still have to see probably how it will then uh, actually fly with petabytes and maybe exabytes in the future. I think petabytes, some have maybe already tried, but exabytes might be really uh, a scaling factor, which needs to be, you know, in the future, uh, probably much more addressed. Um, also, what we can see is that many of the, let's say, people that have already these tons of data, they they don't use this for everything, right? They use the Hadoop distributed file system and the MapReduce engines, usually for very certain tasks, like indexing, for instance. It's not that they all do machine learning, all of it, the indexing, all of it, the um, idea of providing maybe the, the ads with a certain information where the users are, and then displaying the ads in Facebook and so on. So usually you would see that this engine is just used for a couple of specific elements, and we will come to this in a moment. So understanding now this, this kind of replication scheme, which of course fits well to the master head and worker paradigm, but you have to see it now a little bit more data oriented, obviously. The name node will know where all of these blocks are, and this enables us then from the scheduler point of view to think, okay, the, you ask the name node, where is the block one? And then we basically get back the data nodes that become in question. And then the master can use this information if you want to really distribute the map task to the right blocks that are existing, or basically get information that this one block is actually not responding anymore. So we better not use it. Um, this all is also in a replication scheme. That means every time we change one thing, um, we also have to think about that, of course, then we have to replicate this again. Hence, if you want, in one respect, all of this file system that we have here is a bit more optimized to read, read, right? It's not really for rewrite. Um, and, and this has something to do with the idea that, again, the data accumulates over times. And it's not really like a database we have in SQL that, you know, will probably change a couple of times a day heavily. So here people would take rather, you know, several data sets, which, which are rather for reading to get some insights out than, you know, basing having maybe not the accurate data, maybe in the moment, but still um, optimized for read. And with this being much more faster, especially if you have this replication scheme. So, and of course, then avoiding to transporting terabytes of data as we discussed. Uh, again, a little bit about the master head architecture of the name node. Again, important in many of the applications, sort of having a secondary name node 
that then is, you know, basically responsible to perform all the namespace operations in it um, that really keeps track of all the data. We will call that metadata on a certain, you know, data set or data. Um, it's basically blocks that you see there, as we said, with the sharding, right? Basically, we have no no large file here. Oops, sorry for that. Um, basically, come back here. This is still the parts of the file and, and of course, all configurable, but still the, the kind of name node will know the locations and um, can also steer, of course, how big should these blocks are and, and you know, opening, closing, renaming files and so on and directories, all of these typical, let's say, name, uh, file system operations are basically then uh, performed by this. The data node is then of course, executing these requests um, in the end of reading the data, sometimes also maybe write requests, which is of course a bit heavy. And then also replication that is in the end a little bit like in the in the back. So once you configured it, Hadoop will make sure that this is automatically done, right? What is another idea which is different from parallel file systems, for instance, in high performance computing, they don't have really this replication scheme automatically you can do it yourself obviously but still you would replicate in a parallel file system within a hpc system nothing else on being part of the same file system uh, at the same geographical region you know in the same supercomputer so the replication there makes not really much sense in terms of fault tolerance so you would rather transport this again to another let's say hpc center somewhere and this incurs again then having the whole files transferred as I said, when it's about terabytes, this would be already quite a long endeavor. Um, especially when we think about that we're moving towards petabytes in many of the data sets, especially if you accumulate data like the social media data we have here. The good thing is, of course, this is quite scalable. So the number of data nodes you can imagine you can configure like you can configure the workers um, and so on. So it's quite a flexible mechanism. Usually you would have two head nodes, as I said, uh, very similar, like you remember from the Spark engine. Right when we were doing this in HD Insights, because the head is really key. It doesn't matter if, let's say, a data node fails and we have, you know, this marked as being fault and faulty and not used. But let's say if we have only one head oper as operation, keep track of all the data, and this one would fail, which can, of course, it's yet another, let's say, node that is a name node is for hardware irrelevant, right? So that would be no insight. So basically, you would say it could be failing a data node or a name node. So hence the need for a secondary name node is quite obvious to then enable really the fault tolerance. And that both name nodes will fail is of course in principle possible. That's nothing that says it can't, but of course also the, the kind of probability would be of course much less. And in a way you can of course think about of having more head nodes if you want. So how that looks like, if you look a little bit into it, the block replication in the data nodes um, this looks a little bit like here. You have a certain file name in different parts. Um, you do do this also yourself when we do in a in our assignment too. If you remember, we are entering already our practical phase, which is oriented towards assignment two. So you will basically experience with this a little bit yourself. Um, and then you have different block IDs, as it is called, that then have these different parts um, of this data that you see here. For instance, in part zero and part one distributed in different, let's say, data nodes with different blocks. I think this concept is sort of clear. Um, I guess it's not really hard to understand. Also, I wanted to just give you a short um, point here again of one of the use cases of this HDFS in, in social media from Facebook, which is using then the Apache HBase, um, which is a similar idea. And, and this is also, let's say, com something you can combine with Hadoop and basically then also make use of this HDFS. Of course, here, as I said earlier, it's not that Facebook uses just this. So take not the message away that, ah, oh, actually Facebook is just using Apache HBase, a little bit of Hadoop with the file system. That's absolutely not true. They have a very smart, let's say, um, different set of different uh, data um, approaches and one of them is a graph database for instance another one is a new sql key value stair from apache hadoop here this hbase so which is basically oriented towards read a lot right and you can imagine here posts indexing 
is a is something where you don't change the pose. You rather want to indexing to index to know you know basically um, what is inside the pose um, to really find it quickly. If you search for it, and if you of course have some operations to update it uh, with the links to each other, not really changing the pose, but really just the links. This could be all very helpful. Hence, it's a helper tool here for a very specific element where they have also, you can understand Facebook, quite a different set of regions of the data center. And you see here with HBase and also different regional servers that then, you know, basically have parts of the different files here. And they use this then for indexing. And we will explain a little bit more in lecture 14 when we take about, we talk a bit about Bit about the concept of the NoSQL key value stores, while they grown very popular these days. Um, that's why basically you can have almost a whole university course just on this, uh, or maybe combined with SQL and typical relational databases to see the differences, right? So NoSQL um, key value stores are really optimized again for reading and have not this kind of plain schemas usually that you have in the relational databases. But we will talk about this a little bit when we come to lecture 14. Otherwise, of course, I have to think about um, that this is something rather for a database course. But here you see also the, the big data challenge just to make the point that, of course, it makes sense, not makes sense to do this for your little MP3 collection with a couple of gigabytes. But for someone who has to index around 700 terabytes, this is quite something to do. And if you think about that, also the data accumulates all the time in Facebook, people using it on a 24 seven basis internationally, you can imagine this data is growing and growing and growing. Hence, we need something which is really then, you know, vault tolerant, because otherwise we wouldn't like Facebook if our data will just disappear, right? We spend lots of time to make all sorts of posts for business, but maybe also privately, and suddenly the post disappears because, oh, sorry, you see here one disk failed. And Facebook comes back to you soon and well, it says basically, well, thanks for using Facebook, but somehow your posts get lost. Um, we would be not happy. Hence, you can imagine this fault tolerance is also a business factor, right? The reliability that we had discussed a little bit, the dependability of users really for businesses, you know, basically using also Facebook ads. You will notice that Iceland is actually using Facebook quite heavily for event management, right? Many people have just Facebook events to understand how many people are interested, how many people are going. Um, and all of that is sort of a factor that basically now comes into the usability of all of these tools. On the other hand, of course, if you think about now Facebook, um, also need an easy management on all of these different operations, basically because they're so large, they need some software that is doing some things automatically. Having now someone who is doing, you know, the indexing manually, and analyzing this and then basically has not a let's say engine underneath that makes it very quickly possible to go basically across a different region with a dispute file system to execute this map and reduce task to do some small ind indexing could be even word counts right to understand how many words or what words are basically in what posts so this is something where um, these easy management comes in combined of course and with the idea of this uh, fault tolerance. Now, revisiting something like this, now we have better understanding now when you think about Apache Hadoop and Apache Spark, what we had in lecture three, why essentially, um, you know, Spark is so much faster. There's still a HDFS read um, that also Spark has to do to get the data, which is sort of slow. We're reading here from a file system, right? But instead of writing now, for instance, in logistic regression here, this iteratively the same data, right? touching it, working on it on the optimization, write in uh, intermediate results. Then we have to read again the intermediate results, you know, map reduce, write it, read, write, etc., etc. This is all slow using HDFS. Of course, it's fault tolerant and all of that and very distributed, but still not using the memory is basically then here the, the tough challenge where then Spark, you know, is much better of reducing the amounts of HDFS reads really. And also if you think about some of the intermediate results in a logistic regression, for instance, where many of the things are just weights or coefficients, right, of the idea of the logistic regression model, then this may be fit even to memory. You, you can avoid to write to the disk completely. But of course, when the engine is not providing this, and this is a benefit now of Spark, then you basically 
um, are back to the slow paradigm here. Now we can better understand why Spark is then really so much faster in this sense. Of course, we also discussed, and I just make a small comment here, the price, right? So having, of course, in Spark with lots of memory where maybe many terabytes or so will be not always written to this is another factor, right? As we have seen with 700 terabytes data to digest, you also need quite some good memory structures uh, to enable, you know, many of the workers with lots of powerful memory to use Apache Spark, hence quite some costs. And so hence, it's again, of course, a trade-off. And then, you know, looking more in the analytic services, um, we, we will do this more in Practical Lecture 5.1 when I show you a little bit more MapReduce. I just wanted to make the point here that this engine is, of course, now um, quite old, if you, as you have heard, but also basically is available in all the different cloud vendors you can see, right? Especially the, 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 the hyperscalers like Amazon Web Services, MS Asia or Google um, and many others, they use already MapReduce as a very nice parallelization, basic analytic service. And now the basic element is an important factor, right? Because on top of this, uh, MapReduce can be now basically very many different operations or applications um, leveraging this MapReduce and the data locality and the HDFS. Hence, we talk about this ecosystem I was exp you know, basically explaining from a name. You see that all of this is basically now here the Hadoop engine with a very, let's say, central idea of the parallel task execution. And the other part we have with the HDFS giving you a kind of efficient and reliable data storage, right? So this sort of is the same of the Hadoop engine. We have already discussed that there's a smart NoSQL database, right, HBase, uh, which you can combine with, you know, basically the idea of operating them with MapReduce tasks and also accessing as a NoSQL data store then data that is an HDFS file. That would enable then more applications. For instance, you can combine it with Mahout, right, machine learning and data mining, that basically through this stack is also able to leverage MapReduce and HDFS. Um, there's metadata catalogs. We already used Hive a little bit. If you remember at the beginning, uh, there's a script possibility that all leverages and map and different reduce tasks. In other words, these uh, frameworks have already several different implementations of a map and reduce task that always has to be performed again and again for other applications that actually use then Mahout for, for very specific, let's say, domain-specific applications, right? Same is here with relational data, with Scoop, Flume for data streaming, and so on. And you see that also when you look into the cloud vendors. Uh, here's a good example, Google Cloud, you know, our elephant from Hadoop is very much close to the possibility of combining it with Apache Pick, Hive, the SQL scripts, but also, of course, with the Spark engine. Right and other tools that we already learned a little bit about Kafka, for instance, and there are many different. They all called all usually like this open source analytics frameworks, right? So although Hadoop is kind of a core, and the data, you know, the data and file system as well with Spark, and also nowadays um, being very popular because of the memory usage and fast, uh, you see that many of the others like HBase is really an interesting tool. And then Hive, of course, many data sets are still today, of course, very much in SQL databases. So you need for processing and to get something out of a data set in maybe original SQL and put it to, a let's say, this framework here, you need also interesting, let's say, connectivity, which you can use then with Apache Hive to go from the SQL traditional way to do it really distributed here in terms of processing. Let's say fueling a logistic regression, as we have done before, uh, with some, you know, data sets. So coming then further and thinking about, again, um, that you are maybe in a driving seat uh, in your company of creating an in-house cloud, you would say now, okay, interesting, but the same is actually possible, um, the MapReduce engine to create very easily within your own organization. Uh, one of the building blocks you would use for this is, would be OpenStack, and obviously we will talk about this at the end of the course here because it changes a little bit the view of not using hyperscalers but to create your own cloud. We have also motivated this earlier already with sensitive data which you want to not put maybe in the public cloud making it maybe hybrid or so. But you see here the Nova or Nova Cinder blocks which which basically give you then the idea of having uh, a master slave. Sorry for this. This would be of course a master worker architecture 
So and this gives you then possibilities to have different name nodes and also different node managers and data nodes, which then effectively basically have then the, the data nodes. And, and these are tools we will discuss. It is just for you now as a sneak preview to say that you basically can create a, a distributed Hadoop setup within your company, uh, maybe across different regions, different headquarter or elements you know, from different um, positions of the family, uh, from the different um, owners of the different companies, um, whatever it is, what you have in terms of distribution, right, in the company, a data center here, a data center there, you can create your own distributed setup on this using OpenStack. Hence, um, this becomes quite some, let's say, um, configuration and deployment challenge. The more you go, um, basically distributed, you will also find you need some sort of orchestration. You need a helper for deployment. And when you do it, your own, right? In HD Insight, we have seen we click a little bit and create it. And this is all magically created. But if you created your own, let's say, then you need tools like Docker, maybe, where you have a container technology that is quite nice, where in the Docker hub that you have here for the, um, let's say, container technology um, that we will discuss much more in lecture 12. You have already, you see here, Hadoop data node containers, Hadoop, you know, name nodes and so on, available that you can just reuse from the Docker hub, um, install it or deploy it as we call it within your infrastructure. And then you have already the just the configuration to do and everything is already installed. The idea also of then orchestrate how many worker nodes you have, how many name nodes you will do, et cetera. The data nodes, you can also use Kubernetes, kubelets, and so on, uh, which makes it then a little bit a big, more automated and a bit more bigger, right? So you that would be something that you really then for larger installations. But you will also see if you go to the Google Cloud, for instance, many, many of the, uh, you know, Google uh, of the of the large cloud vendors, so to speak, are using these technologies. So towards the end, however, of this lecture, I just wanted to leave on the table that although I teach now MapReduce is a good idea, especially if you think about the automatic sort shuffle, you know, and grouping, which is happening in between based on this key and then the key value store structure. So this is, of course, beautiful but it's also important to understand that there are certain limits right that not every problem can be solved with it hence you need still high performance computing for instance right for instance uh, i brought here some some different examples i think if you have amazon online retail sales and the the problem that the sales you know people you know doing the sale or basically you know buying something um, on a you know minute basis, that means a lot of lot of updates on the product databases, right? For each of the different actions, even if you search something, it will be remembered, or you put something uh, somewhere you know in in the bucket for buying later. So um, it changes a lot um, the data, but um, it's basically not really calculation, right? So in this sense, um, this is something where um, you know. This is, you know, something where you would not really do and produce for everything on this kind of idea and maybe store the data still here and there in other databases. But of course, then for analyzing it, like buying patterns, you would take a snapshot and, and then put it to the MapReduce engine for certain analytics. Still, you would have maybe a proper product database with updates and so on of usage and so on. Another example might be machine learning methods, which really gives you now the idea of iterative um, challenges, right? We discussed it a little bit when we thought about the memory versus non-memory memory usage in Apache Hadoop. If you remember, the idea of every time using the same data and then have iteratively MapReduce, again, shipping the same MapReduce tasks again and again and again to it. And in a way, you will learn later in lecture six and seven um, deep learning particularly is using a lot of these iterations, right? Out average updates of the um, uh, of the trained weights, for instance, in every little step. Hence, this would be very hard to perform deep learning, uh, basically, in, in a distributed fashion. It is possible, but it would be very slower than, for instance, leveraging cutting-edge high-performance computing. Hence, you will see that many of the machine learning tools these days, especially deep learning, techniques we will explore later in the course require really 
high performance computing in the sense of even you know going across different nodes using different gpus and so on which is another factor of it think about that deep learning is fueled by gpus as we learned in the earlier course parts and we will explore more in lecture six here to basically then use iterative map reduce would be quite an overhead and not really good distributed deep learning rather lives from something like pytorch gdp or basically have tensorflow combined with horror what we will discuss uh, also in lecture six seven and so on hence um the, the typical map reduce has limits right for instance an iterative map reduce would be beautiful um, and you would use that for logistic regression for smaller machine learning algorithms for maybe decision trees for basically also uh, alternatively squares or other algorithms that fuel a little bit recommendation engines. But you have to take the message that, um, you know, numerical solvers um, that maybe are also key ingredients of many of the physical applications we have, right? So that are based basically on known physical laws using numerical methods um, or optimizations and, and solvers. Um, these will be not very simply to be transformed to map reduce engines right they communicate a lot we have the examples again of you know you can see the ocean simulation here we do also in the high performance computing course for example but also think about weather prediction every let's say iteration matters it will exchange lots of parameters as we discussed before with message passing interface ideas much more low level communication so that means definitively then um, of course you lose a lot of this you know, simpliness um, that we have here, right? So, of course, in, in MPI programming, you really have to address the different cores you want to talk to and so on. So it's much more low-level programming, but then, of course, enables you different applications. Hence, they will coexist in, in, my, in my view, a long time. As I said earlier, the HPC and HTC that we have rather here in, in MapReduce, it will be a paradigm that stands the test of time also of the next decade and, and probably even more. What will change is maybe then the view how computing is done in quantum rather, right? So quantum computing puts a new element in it. Um, so that's quite interesting for you maybe to explore in the next 10 to 20 or 30 years what quantum computing will bring us. Right, so having talked this, here's a nice, I think, ecosystem example with Cassandra, another key value store. Uh, and not, another modern technology if you compare it to the more traditional SQL engines. And I would leave it as this in the moment and would encourage you to look at the video. We then continue with practical lecture 5.1 the next time. So thank you very much and talk to you soon.